Hello, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our um, followers on Zoom and also our uh, followers uh, on Facebook as well. I'm Faisal Saleh, the founder and executive director of the Palestine Museum US. Uh, today, we are honored and uh, fortunate to have uh, Dr. Salman Abbasitta with us. Uh, in a moment, um, uh, a more formal introduction uh, for, for Salman. Um, the, uh, uh, the session uh, is being recorded and it will be available uh, on Facebook immediately at the end of the program. Uh, also, we will have it available on our uh, Palestine Museum US website and uh, on YouTube as well. So hopefully if you miss part of it uh, and you want to share it with your friends, you can do so. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And without further ado, I would like to introduce the uh, museum's team, uh, Nancy Nesbitt, the head curator. Nancy, please wave. Uh, and then Mervat Suwade, the Director of Communications. Uh, uh, Nancy will provide the formal introduction. Nancy, please. Hello, I'm Nancy Nesmith, Head Curator at the Palestine Museum US. Um, Dr. Salman Abu Sita, brilliant cartographer and the founder and president of the Palestine Line Society in London, has dedicated his career to the documentation of Palestine's land and people. He is the author of six books on Palestine, including Atlas of Palestine 1917 to 1966, with both English and Arabic editions, Atlas of the Return Journey, and over 300 papers and articles on Palestinian refugees, the right of return, and the history of the Nakba and human rights. In his memoir, Mapping My Return, he wrote of his life in Palestine and his struggle as a refugee to return. Following his numerous books and lectures on the cartography and history of Palestine, including his 2010 publication, Atlas of Palestine, 1917 to 1966, analyzing the mandate, the partition plan, and illustrating Palestine's borders, land ownership, population composition, the 1948 war, the Nakba, and more, and extending his analysis beyond his 2004 Atlas of Palestine 1948. Dr. Salman Sita has now delved further back in Palestine's history, geography, and demographics to publish his latest book, Atlas of Palestine 1871 to 1877. In this work, he has brought modern scientific methods to correct the 1871 to 1878 survey of Palestine and enlighten the world to the true boundaries, population, and family names in Palestine before colonialization. The more than 500 page atlas corrects the location and population errors and misspelled and missing names of places and families to achieve a level of accuracy not seen in the original survey nor in any document since then. We're happy to have him join us to discuss his Atlas of Palestine, 1871 to 1877 here. Again, thank you, Dr. Salman Abu Sita. I now turn it over to you. Thank you, Nancy, very much. And thanks to Faisal and uh, the Palestinian Museum for the opportunity to speak to you. We have overcome the problems of uh, Corona, so now we can speak to each other um, as if there is no problem. I hope we will always communicate like that and we, help, we would overcome geography which separates us. Um, it's often said that the 19th century is a dormant century. In fact, it isn't. What we have suffered in, in, 19, in the 20th century has always been planned before in 19th century. And the important uh, element of uh, the 19th century is that Europe has tried to come back to the Middle East, to Palestine, after 700 years of absence since the Crusades. They Europe returned not with armies, but with 
different kind of armies. They sent priests, travelers, officers, and even spies to Palestine to chart the future we live in today. The first uh, um, activity of this kind was taken by Napoleon when he attacked Egypt in 1799. Although it lasted only three years, it had a lasting effect because he brought with him 170 scientists who charted the life of Egyptians in every possible way. But soon after, the uh, Germans uh, came to Palestine to plot its land, its to topography. In the middle of the 19th century, maps by um, Keyport and Van de Velde were very widely distributed. But then the British caught up with, the, um, with this activity and they started what's called Survey of Western Palestine. This survey is very important for the reasons I'm going to explain. Um, it is initiated by Palestine Expression Fund established in 1985 in England under the patronage of Queen Victoria but it was very heavily um, composed of a variety of people. I'm going to give some examples of those people who formed PEF, Palestine Expression Fund. Many of them were senior churchmen. Then there were professors also, untitled nobility and distinguished personalities and officers with related skills and also they had some European scholars with them. But that's not all, that's not all. There were um, Jews uh, in Europe and especially in England and evangelist Christians. They were all involved in the original formation of the um, society. Of the Jews who were involved was Baron Leon uh, Rothschild and whose family had financed some projects in Palestine, but indirectly. And then we have Sir Moses Montefiore and Lawrence Oliphant. Um, the purpose, declared purpose of the um, PF, now they have a survey called Survey of Western Palestine. I have to explain why they call it Western Palestine, because they assume Palestine um, is spread over the River Jordan. So the survey was only concerned mainly in west of the River Jordan, which we call Palestine. Their purpose, the mission given to the survey of Western Palestine or SWP is very clear. It is to investigate the archeology, span geography, geology, and natural history of Palestine. Its declared purpose was to assert or affirm the veracity of the Bible geographically. They wanted it to be quote unquote scientific, not a matter of faith. But they also, not very clearly spelled out, but it is in the original document, they wanted to know the location of the Jewish temple, if it was there. They wanted to know the location of the city of David. They also wanted to know the authenticity of the location of the Holy Sepulchre Church. They also wanted to know, these are all subtitles, additional requirements. They wanted to know the date of the construction of the Dome of the Rock. They came to Palestine in 1871 they stayed in the field on and off till 1877. They have set up 190 camps all over Palestine. Each camp was populated by a number of officers, British officers, with, of course, local guys and so on. They would chart and draw the map of the location within that camp, and then they move on to another camp. Um, the maps they have published show 
when they were here or there. Then they went back to England and they took all these documents with them. They spent considerable time sorting out this data, writing it up, making it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a manner to be published. We'll explain that in a moment. So um, when I was doing my PhD in London, um, I spent a lot of time visiting the British archives and libraries and so on, because I found um, quite early actually since 1960, that our history and geography are kept by the colonial powers more than ourselves, because we knew where Bethlehem is and where Jerusalem is, but they wanted to know where it was. So they were keen to keep documentation about Palestine. And then I found a treasure of information. I came across in the Royal Geographical Society about the documents prepared by SWP, Survey of Western Palestine. There were 12 big volumes and 26 maps. And 26 maps are the subject of our discussion today. But the 12 volumes, three of them were about the places uh, of Palestine, villages and um, the, uh, uh, the topography of Palestine. There were also two or three volumes about Jerusalem itself. There was one volume about fauna and flora of Palestine. And it was really comprehensive for its time. It was not comprehensive, of course, for our time today for understandable reasons. So when I looked at them over several years, um, I found there are certain things, uh, of course, to be preserved because it is the only record we have of such magnitude. They listed in 26 uh, uh, maps, 9,000 names. Uh, and it actually, in some ways, it's better than the French um, survey of Egypt called La Description de l'Egypte. It's better than that because it's mostly um, scientifically based, while the French survey was mostly descriptive. Now, we have three main issues today of the survey. The first issue is the accuracy of the maps. The accuracy of the maps was fairly poor, I'd say why, because they have taken uh, field maps and took them to London. They don't know where this field map should be by today's standards, like by geographical coordinates. So they have attempted to find an approximate way where this map of Safad or Akka, where it should be in the world map. Um, the geographical coordinates were not at the time um, well established. And so there was an error in that. We compared this with our GIS system, geographical information system. We found that the location of points in the map of PF or SWP are shifted to the east by 450 meters, almost half a kilometer. And in the vertical side, in the north and south side, by 100 meters plus or minus. Now, if that was uniform, it will be easy. We shift them once. But they were not uniform because every one of the camps, 190 camps, has a different error of itself. So we did several methods described in the atlas how to arrive to the best way to um, uh, get accuracy. And we did. Um, actually, we can say that the average error now is very small, few meters. But that is not true everywhere because it's the average error. Um, the error in some places could be larger, could be less. Anyway, in that sense, the maps now we have produced are corrected to the location. The second error we found that the names uh, in Arabic and English, the names in English are taken from Arab uh, guides who were with them, Palestinian guides, and they recorded it. So as they hear it, they write it in English. Of course, there is no uniform way of converting 
Arabic and English. In other words, transliteration is not uniform. Now we have a system of that, but for them, it was adequate enough. But the important thing is the Arabic names, the original names they heard. These they recorded um, by sound, and therefore they have a difference of uh, fa and qaf, sin and sad, ain and hamza, and so on, which they could not uh, do that. Although they had the benefit of a uh, professor of Arabic in Cambridge University. We'll come back to this man because he played the right. An interesting anecdote about that. They have used a man called Nu'man Qasatli, uh, a Palestinian, actually Syrian from Damascus. Um, he's Christian and he was uh, recommended by the British consul. And he actually wrote the Arabic names correctly. And he has a great deal um, of credit. But with that spirit in the Victorian age, they only referred to him the native scribe. When I checked his background, I found he, is, he was an accomplished geographer. He published several books about the geography of Palestine and Syria. And so I said, maybe for, for them, he's no more than a native scribe. Um, the third element which we have found that the field reports taken from Palestine to England, they were not all fully used. They only used some of them for various reasons, maybe time, maybe space in the map. Um, now we don't have that problem because we can zoom in, zoom out. So we made an agreement with Palestine Exploration Fund celebrating, by the way, it's 150 years of establishment today. We made a contract with them. Please uh, let us see um, the original reports which brought by the officers from England. And we paid for that, of course, but they opened boxes for us, not open for 150 years. And we uh, um, scanned all the original documents and we used them in order to complement and improve the uh, printed version of the maps. And from that, we found many things. For example, we found there are 4,000 names not mentioned in the printed version. We also found description of holy sites not given. Um, and there are other things described in the map. And in this connection, I would like to start by asking um, Faisal to show us the first map. Can we do that? Can we see the first map? Is it possible? Yeah, the first map, actually, I wanted to show you the limits of the survey, limits of the survey taken. Um, first map shows, oh, yeah, there it is, there it is. First map, you see the blue or greenish area is the part of the survey in Palestine. Zoom out a little, please. A little, a little. The brown spot uh, uh, in the north uh, is today part of Lebanon. Yes, this part of Lebanon. At the time, of course, they didn't know where Palestine final mandate limits will be. So they started from Litani River. And the top line um, is the Litani River. And, and then the green is Palestine. There is a little brown area at the bottom. It's another survey done by a man called Shoemacher in 1886. He wanted to finish the part of uh, Palestine and South. The limit, the southern limit of the survey is Wadi Gaza, which is now between Gaza City and Khan Yunus City. They stopped there, they could not go any further. The total area of that is 14,000 square kilometers. The exact number is in the atlas. And um, uh, it represents 56% of Palestine as we know it today. But it is mostly the heavily populated part of, 
of Palestine. Can I see next one, please? And from the 26 sheets, which are shown here in black lines, um, we have created 500 pages shown in, in red. So the 26 sheets in a scale of one to 63,000 are made into 500 pages to a scale of one to 25,000, where you can see a lot of detail, a lot of detail. Next one, please. Here are two examples, uh, some examples of uh, what we have done. On the left side is the original uh, PF survey. And on the right side is our atlas. What is the difference? First of all, we have enhanced the terrain using NASA, NASA satellite images. And so we can uh, show clearly the hills and the wadis more than before. We also outlined in uh, white windows the names in both Arabic and English. In the survey, it was only in English. We have put in the name in Arabic and English. Um, we also added from the field maps all the things we found not found in the original survey. Um, we also put symbols of things. We have changed the color with the wadis and the rivers in blue and the roads in black and so on. Uh, so uh, we also made symbols for something which is very, very important in the history of Palestine. We have 34,000 holy sites in Palestine, historical sites. And we, on the average, every village has about three or four, which is really not found anywhere in the world. So when you say Palestine is a holy land, this is absolutely correct. And these holy sites, which we have listed, are not only Muslim, they could be Christian, they could be pre-Christian and even Byzantian and before that. So they are very important part of our history. Next one. Next one, please. This is another uh, map. Again, the, uh, the uh, left side is the original survey and the right side is our survey. Uh, where we have added a number of things. Um, next one, please. One of the beautiful results of this uh, survey we have made is uh, we found um, one of the volumes done. It's called Fauna and Flora of Palestine. Marvelous work published in 1886. And um, it was done by Canon Tristram. Uh, imagine that this religious man has taken the trouble over so many years to record even with paintings like this one uh, of the fauna and flora of Palestine. This picture of a bird is called sunbird or Tamir Palestine. This picture has helped us a great deal because Israel, as you know, not what took our land, but also they wanted to expropriate uh, falafel and hummus and tahina and everything. So they claimed that this bird is Israel bird, national bird. And the Palestinians have a big long battle in 2015 until the world recognized that this bird here, um, sun bird is really Palestine national bird, not Israel national bird. So this was one of the better conclusions of the survey. Next one, please. This is uh, something which you uh, can really, from that, understand what did the survey do. All the black spots here, or black points, are towns and villages which we have recorded right from the survey. You can see that there are some spaces like in the coastal area and somewhere in the middle. And I have added in this area, space area, I have added the 
Israeli Zionist colonies planted in Palestine during the British mandate. You can see easily they were only planted when there are spaces between the villages. Through the British mandate, they allowed them to build their colonies where there is no village. As you see, coastal plan, they are in blue. The colonies are in blue, and you can see them in the coastal area and along Marj bin Amr between Haifa and Tiberias, and so on. So this is a very clear example how the maps of Palestine survey used to start the colonization of Palestine. Um, uh, if you look, I have made uh, an inset in the, uh, uh, around Jaffa. Jaffa had um, a, a neighborhood area um, north of Jaffa city. It has, it has Jewish built houses. They call it Tel Aviv. And now Tel Aviv, of course, 1936, became a separate uh, a municipality. But it was just a suburb, a colony, an extension um, in the sand dunes north of, uh, of Jaffa City. Okay, so there are many other aspects of how the survey was used. But when we examined, when we examined um, the documents, you find easily so many traits which cannot escape the eye and the mind of today. What are they? First of all, all these memoirs, these are the books written about the maps, all of them are imbued with the crusader spirit. For example, they would find an old uh, stone. They would photograph it left and right. They would spend days measuring it and writing about it and describing you know, everything to do with it. But at the same time, they ignored Muslim shrines, which are by far the majority. They even mentioned them as being tombs or, or ruins or old sites with no names. But when it was relating to crusaders, which is actually, by the way, not their objective. Their objective is the biblical history biblical geography, and the Crusaders are, you know, uh, something which came uh, um, in the year 1100 or something. So it's not their job to do that, but they actually spend so much time. But one of the sad things or startling things about this Crusader spirit, they will spend three or four pages about a stone when they find a trace of something or other, and they would never mention anything about the people of the district. They do not speak about Palestinian people. The only thing they mention about the people who are alive in the country are 20 helpers and cooks carrying their luggage and 20 animals carrying their luggage. That's the only living creatures they describe in the memoirs not the people of Palestine. I'll explain why, because this is an essential element of the settler colonial uh, ideology. They never mentioned them, although, although they, have, they have the requirement to, to say they wanted to know the habits and customs of the people, probably to learn from them um, the, uh, uh, something about the Bible, but they didn't. They didn't, pages and pages describing um, an old uh, stone, but not the people. Now, all this, you can say, this is a cultural or ideological ailment. I call it ailment, right? Let us call it that. But what is the objective of the survey itself? It's supposed to describe the veracity, veracity of the uh, geography of the Bible which is admirable from that point of view. But it wasn't really like that. It was really the elephant in the room, the missing from all the documentation is the military objective of that. There is a huge and 
very difficult to conceal the military objective of that. And they used the survey of Western Palestine as a cover for the espionage, for their making maps of the Middle East to be used for 20 years later in the First World War. Who was running this in secret? It was the War Office. The War Office of England, first of all, they introduced, they gave them free the services of the officers, um, as if it is a gift for scientific research. But these uh, survey officers were trained military officers. Um, then then um, they, they claimed that they have no money to complete it, so the War Office paid funds for them to complete it. Now, let me give you an, some examples of these survey officers. One of them is called Palmer. He's the Arabist uh, person. He was professor of uh, Arabic in Cambridge, and he was sent to uh, uh, Egypt uh, in 1882 to uh, agitate the tribes of Sinai against the Egyptian government because at the time there was a revolution in Egypt by Urabi Basha and they were afraid he would block the Suez Canal. So they sent this mission uh, to Sinai with bags of gold to bribe the sheikhs of Sinai so that they would not obstruct the Suez Canal or they do not sign side, take sides with Urabi Basha. And of course, the end of this Palma is very uh, sorry because he was killed and the bags of gold disappeared. There is another man who came, became in history very well known. A young man of 20 years old, he started the survey. His name is Kitchener. Kitchener became very famous. He was very bright. He went to became the, uh, um, continued the survey in South of Palestine, in Garandal, in Wadi Araba. And actually, he ended by being the chief commander or Sirdar of the Egyptian army. Very meteoric rise of this young man. He became actually minister of war in 1916. He drowned in the sea at the time. So this man, his career is descriptive of the objective of the survey. There is another man, a Captain Stewart Newcomb, very bright man again. He actually uh, made a survey of southern Palestine from Gaza or Gaza to Aqaba. And this map uh, was very detailed, showing how many wells there are. Uh, what the what water is like, whether it's salty for the uh, uh, potable or not. And the roads, are they accessible by beast or vehicle? And all these maps, I'll tell you in a moment, um, have been used. It's an excellent map. But this man, Newcomb, who made this map, he surfaced again 10 years later. He did this map in 1944. He surfaced again 10 years later. Where did he service? Where did he appear again? He appeared again in Northern Palestine. He charted the boundary of Palestine with Lebanon and Syria in conjunction with his French colleague, Captain Poulet. Captain Poulet and Captain Newcomb are the people responsible for what we call today Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon. So it wasn't all that innocent, yeah. But we have another man, which were very well known, of course, at least in the movies, T. Lawrence. T. Lawrence was a novice. He was introduced in the 1914 to be uh, an archeologist. He wanted with his colleagues to write a book about called Wilderness in Zin, Zin Wilderness. Ostensibly it is to study the archaeology of Palestine, but actually it was to report about the Ottoman forces in the area. 
Then the man called Schumacher, uh, which I mentioned, is a German officer affiliated with the PF, but he was reporting on the Hejaz Railway, which was the most important uh, transportation project in 1905. And he actually made a detailed map of the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights since then became uh, an integral part of the Zionist demands to take over Palestine and the area around it. So all these people served their purposes clearly. And um, Alembi, when he took uh, Beersheba on the 20, uh, 30th of November, 30th of October, 1917, he relied heavily uh, on these maps. I show this in the Atlas, how he relied heavily, how the maps are there. And when Alembi uh, took Beersheba, um, on 31st of October 1917, he sent a telegram to London saying, we took Beersheba, Jerusalem will be your Christmas present. And the cable arrived in London on 1st of November. Second day, Balfour opened his drawer and he took the agreement, he agreed already with the Zionist and he made his infamous declaration on 2nd of November, 1917. So the history is uh, now very clear how we arrived at this. Now, uh, I will, um, uh, forgive me. Uh, yes, here we are. Uh, I, I just want to add one thing uh, uh, to the list of the officers who were part of this, Herbert Samuel, we know who Herbert Samuel is. He was the Zionist uh, Jewish uh, first uh, British High Commissioner of Palestine. He arrived in Palestine in uh, end of June, 1920, to be the High Commissioner of Palestine. The job of the mandate is to bring Palestine to be an independent state like Iraq. It was mandate class A, like Iraq. And now we know Iraq became a country and Palestine was allowed to be um, um, a place where settlers, Jewish settlers from Europe to come in. Now, Herbert Samuel hardly smelled the air of Palestine two months later from his arrival. He sent to London a list of 55 uh, village names in Palestine taken from PF survey and telling London to wipe the names out and put Hebrew names for that. That's a measure of the honesty of someone who came to help Palestine. Imagine his priority was to change the nature of Palestine by uh, introducing Hebrew names for these. Now, as you can see, uh, uh, all these maps have been the blueprint of the Zionist colonization of Palestine. So we can safely say that the colonization of Palestine started embryonically 150 years ago. Of course, it took up to the First World War to make it real, but all the elements of that were created then. Now, Leaving the maps aside, what would we learn from all this? We end today with Palestine being declared as a nation state of Jews around the world. How did we cross that long path from 19, uh, 150 years from 1871 till today? There are many stations in the road, all very painful, we know them, First World War, Balfour Declaration, Palestinian Revolt in 1936, and Nakba in 1948, Attack of Egypt 1956, um, uh, Occupation of the rest of Palestine 1967, and the attacks on in Syria and Lebanon in 1982, and you know the rest when we talk today about um, Jordan Valley and so on. Now, it amazes me, it amazes me 
how many wars were waged on us in these 150 years. So many wars. Let me count some of them for you. I counted 10 kinds of wars, not military battles, kinds of wars, 10 kinds of wars. The first kind of war is a military one, which we all know how they conquered Palestine from an area of 6% during the British mandate to 100% and more. But the second war waged against us is silencing the voice of the victims. In 1948, we recorded 155 massacres and atrocities. Now, in that time, there was New York Times, AP, UPI, and so on. Not one of those news agents reported this. And even after that, when anyone tried to mention that massacres were a weapon of ethnic cleansing, they would be silenced. So the silencing war is the second one. The third war is political. When the United Nations um, have resolutions against Israeli violations, um, the UN votes against them. And so they render the international law redundant and useless. We can cite many examples of that, but let us go on. The fourth war against us is geographical. We have in the Atlas of Palestine, not this one, the one before that, we listed 55,000 names in Palestine. The Israelis uh, wiped them out, all of them, and replaced them with only 600, 6,800, almost 10%. And all these are contrived names. So the geography of Palestine is wiped out. And so they think. The fifth war against it is historical. For example, the history of the area in Israeli books is blank pages from um, 60 AD till First World War. Nothing, nothing talked about Byzantine, about Arab and Islamic is zero. And therefore it's replaced, this vacuum is replaced by a fictitious story which de defies all the landmarks, architectural landmarks in Palestine. The, the sixth war is archeological. Archeology span is really a record of history. I think very few people know that when they demolished five or 600,000 villages in Palestine, they not only had tractors and bulldozers, they had archeologists waking, walking with them, saying, keep that pace because we think there is a stone we can claim to be Jewish stone. And anything else will be destroyed. Arab, Islamic, uh, Ottoman, um, Byzantine, Roman, all this will be destroyed in the villages unless they think there is a, um, a sign that they can use. I have maps of this in the Atlas. The seventh war against us is religious and racist in which God is recruited to win that war. God is uh, recruited to be the real estate agent who distributes the world and who says this piece is for you and not for anybody else. Now, anyone with, with enlightened mind would not take that, but it is used. Uh, Danny is something used that in the United Nations. He said, the West Bank, God gave us this. Why do you argue? It's God given. The eighth war against us, which is now very common, is defamation. If you fight for your rights, if you defend your rights, you are a terrorist. Imagine describing Edward Said, the brilliant man, as a professor of terror. United Nations officials who actually describe the atrocities uh, done against Palestinians are called anti-Semites. The ninth war against us is the legal, uh, is legal war. Domestic laws sometimes in, in some countries, I don't need to count them, you know who they are. They say BDS is illegal. What does BDS say? BDS says international law should be valid doesn't say anything else. So the legal war, domestic law, it's not so far 
applied in the international arena. But in domestic laws in Germany and US and some states says that. But now we have a new battle in the International Criminal Court. Every country which, um, uh, I mean, they sub make submissions of ICC that Israel is not to be taken to task. Israel is not to be to brought to justice. But you ask simply why? If there is a crime, let ICC investigate it. If they are innocent, fine. The Tenth War, which is very powerful, of course, because it depends on, on lots of financial wealth, is economic. Um, we know that Jewish National Fund entirely lives in that, but now take the modern story of the blockade of Gaza. They are de de deprived from food and, and medicine and all that. And the West Bank, of course, the Oslo disaster, makes the um, West Bank a hostage to the, to the economic uh, uh, war against Palestinians. Now, I would like to conclude here by saying, I have not seen in any history of colonization that the colonial powers needed to wage so many wars. The French in Algeria did not have to do all this. They simply, um, took things by force, and they don't have to change the history or geography or all that. The British in India did not have to do that. The Dutch in South Africa did not have to do that. Now, why do they have to wage so many wars? Because their project, which started with the survey of Western Palestine, in many ways goes against history and geography. Take the case that Palestine is a land without people. Can you imagine that the Zionist Commission submitted to the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919, a map of Palestine, not showing 13,000 names as the survey shows. It shows blank area and call it pastor land where nomads live. And yet the British and the French who done the surveys, they believe them. So I was wondering all the time, could they be so ignorant as to think that Palestine is a land without people? But then when you study the, 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 the colonial, colonial, settler colonial uh, ideology, it says that, it says that the people of the country are immaterial, they are nobody. And therefore we will make Palestine a land without people because its people are not worthy of mention. Can we then surrender ourselves to this fate? No, we cannot. Today, when the survey came to Palestine, there we were only 600,000 people. Now we are 13 million. 13 million, but we are dispersed in the world, in many places in the world, including the United States. And we are still alive and well. In spite of the fact that we have 150 years since the survey and we endured two major wars and many regional wars, and we can find that there is a lesson of history which we cannot ignore. The demise and abolition of racism and apartheid, fascism, Nazism, formal communism, the end of colonial project in Asia and Africa, all of those, all of those have vanished in the last century, except in Israel. Could this last? It's my belief that the people of the land of Palestine will triumph, that they will be restored to their land, that the last colonial project in the world will be dead as others did. And will remain, however, and this is the sad part, I conclude by this instance, it will remain, however, this tragedy of Palestine, the colonial project in Palestine, it will remain as a black dot in the history of those who created it and a good lesson for humanity to learn from it and not repeat it ever again. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Salman. Uh, we uh, have a few uh, questions from people on Zoom and also from Facebook. Uh, our museum team uh, are going to field those questions. Uh, but before we get into that, um, uh, people would like to know uh, where the book is available for purchase. Has it been published in the US yet or is it just published in England? And some people are asking the, the museum to carry the book and sell it. They, they say they'd rather buy it there than buying it from Amazon. Um, so uh, please tell us a little bit about the availability of the book in the United States. Yes, um, the Atlas is the printer shop now and it will be available uh, uh, within, within July. Uh, uh, it could be shipped from anywhere where uh, not anywhere, but some places where we, where we have a store. Um, we would welcome uh, any party in the United States to be a distributor because uh, it is heavy, two and a half kilo, uh, kilograms, and the transportation is expensive. If someone or somebody um, would, would act as a uh, distribution center would be very glad from which they can distribute in the United States. We will ship to them in the United States. Um, so we are ready to hear any suggestions now or later. Yeah, we, uh, the museum will put their name in on that list with you. Uh, we're happy to do that and uh, we will discuss that offline. Thank you. Um, Mervat and Nancy. Mervat, uh, questions, Mervat, you have, unmute yourself first. Yes, we have a few questions from uh, Zoom. I'll uh, read out the questions in the order in which uh, people posted them. So the first question uh, from Dalal Hamoudeh, she's asking, what was the stance of the Ottomans at the time and what factors made the survey possible? Sorry, uh, there is some noise here. Okay. I didn't get the question. I couldn't okay. the question. The question was, yes, uh, what was the stance of the Ottomans at the time and what factors made such activity as the survey possible? Uh, sorry. I the Ottoman. To... You, you can't yeah, hear I'm... me? I seem, seem oh. to lost the image. Uh, uh, we, uh, Can others we, hear me? Can others hear me? I, yes, yes. Yeah, I hear oh, you, okay. but okay. I, there's no picture. There's no uh, picture. We can okay. see you and we can hear you. So go mm -hmm. ahead. Okay, never mind. Uh, what, what did the uh, Ottomans say about that? Correct. And what factors made the survey possible? Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, it puzzled me, how could the Turks allow this? Um, uh, I, I think the reason that they have posed themselves as being archaeologists, looking at old uh, artifacts uh, that uh, they uh, want uh, to dig in history and um, uh, that the country is very uh, rich in history and they want to do that. But there are instances, like in 1914, when the, the threat, uh, the British th threat to the uh, Ottoman rule in Palestine became apparent. And so they stopped them. Um, but they managed to do it uh, through a bribing of some officials. Um, uh, this is a very valid question. For example, when they did surveys in um, Jerusalem, which precedes that survey, um, they, uh, some mutasarrif, which is the governor of Jerusalem, some of them kicked them out. Others allowed them in. So it is a sign of um, the, the loose control of the Ottomans. Let us remember one thing. After the Crimean War in 1856 between Russia and, and, um, and Turkey um, with, with the help of Europe, um, there has been a lot of pressure on the uh, Ottoman rule in Palestine to be more relaxed about foreigners. 
they allowed them to come in, but in small doses. They allowed them to set up consulates. For example, all the European consulates have been established in Palestine at this time. The Russian consulate was established in 1834 and the, um, and the British one in 1856 and so on. Um, so there was uh, some kind of uh, uh, intimidation, if you like, um, uh, of the Turkish rule and they have to be a little bit more lenient. Through that hall, uh, these surveys were made. And we have a follow-up question on that if, uh, from Beverly Volotion. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. She's asking if, there were, uh, if you found any evidence of Palestinians reacting to Westerners during that, the survey, or the, uh, the Westerners who came to Palestine in the 19th century in general. You mean Palestinians working with them? Yeah, if there was any reaction, if I understand correctly, I think she's, I don't know if she's asking about the survey or to the Westerners in general coming to Palestine in the 19th century. Uh, Were there any resistance? Was there any resistance to that? Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. To the yes. survey. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. There was, there was many cases of resistance. There's a case in 1875 when Kitchener set up camp in Safad and the people were suspicious. Who are these foreigners who came to their country to measure it and to you know, know its nature? And they actually attacked them first verbally. They had a quarrel between them and Kitchener ended with a, a stone uh, hitting his forehead. She was bleeding and Konda his senior uh, was put out of action. And as a result, the survey was put out of action for several months. Um, the result was that the British complained to British authorities, uh, to the Ottoman authorities, and they came and made people pay penalties for that. But it was not the only one. They were very suspicious. And some of them were saying, hey, what are these foreigners coming here? Are the crusaders coming back to us? and that kind of thing. So on the popular level, there has been at least a dozen cases in which people uh, uh, resisted that, but they have no power to stop them. Next question, Murat. So a uh, question, next question from Amr Karim. Uh, Amr says, I'm basically from Jrash. Jarash. It's a village. No, no, no. Jrash. Jrash. It's a village in western side of Jerusalem. I have oh. found my village name on Atlas spelled wrongly in Arabic and English on the tables mentioning the inhabitants. And it does not exist on Atlas map. Is there any possibility to locate my village considering the correction of Dr. Salman, Dr. Salman has done? Well, I look for it with pleasure. If you leave your email, I'll, I'll reply to you. Um, the name is familiar. Uh, I can think of, uh, you know, remembering it, but I can, I can. By the way, let me say one thing. One study which should be taken by, a, by a, a brilliant geography student is to compare uh, the Atlas of 1817 with the Atlas we made of Palestine 1945. Um, this study is very interesting because it shows you which villages were there and which villages uh, were, you know, during the British mandate were there. We did something like that, but we went further, not only 18, 1945 and then 1877, but we have a record of the Ottoman tax register of 1596 almost 400 years earlier. Then we are fortunate to find in London, the record by the Palestinian Bishop Eusebius in the year 313, he made a book, geographical book, place names to help the pilgrims to Jerusalem how to find their way. 
So we have these four elements and we compare them. We compare them and it's remarkable that the location is the same. The names are very frequently the same with slight phonetical changes. And he, of course, not to mention Bethlehem and Nasra, but also mention Rama and uh, Aram and all these names, they are the same. And I would say that the villages listed in Eusebius, Bishop Eusebius list of three, 313 AD could have been um, the place where Jesus Christ was walking. He must have been walking in these streets. Now, all this is recorded. And to my great regret, and in fact, to the regret of humanity, most of these are destroyed by Israel in 1948. And in the Atlas, we show the names of those which are 2000 year old, and we show their present location, and we show which ones were destroyed by Israel in 1948. Thank you. Uh, next question from Facebook from Suraya Mislah. This is not uh, specifically related to the maps, but it's, it's a history question. Uh, she says, um, can you talk and indicate materials about Palestinian women and resistance, including in literature, during the revolt of 1936 to 1939? Have yes, you gotten that, into that topic? Yeah, yes, yes, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I have written a short piece on that. It's in the direction of the book about Palestinian women to be published soon. But this is not the point. The point is um, the, um, the British uh, brutal destruction of Palestinian society in 1936 to 1939 is a crime which will never be forgotten. The uh, Palestinian society was decimated. Villages were destroyed by air. Collective punishment was created. Tens of thousands of people were injured or imprisoned. The leaders of political parties have been deported. So I say frequently that 1939 is the British inflicted uh, Nakba of Palestine. 10 years later, Ben Gurion found it easy to continue. There is a very good book which appeared in London this year, it's called uh, British specification of Palestine. It describes, it's based on thousands of files, British files and Israeli files, describing the great brutality. Imagine that this is done by Britain, which is supposed to protect the Palestinians. And even 1948, they let massacres like Dir Yassin and about 20 others happen under their own eye and they do not protect. So, I advise everybody not to neglect the black spot of uh, Britain during 1936 to 39 revolt. And there are books coming out very well described. Okay, um, I have another follow up on the Ottoman uh, question. It appears that the loose governmental control over Palestine made it easier for the Zionist colonization. How important would be the institutional work for the future Palestinian generations? What is the recommendations for them? This is from Khaled Shaban. It's very, very important that we uh, record, which is luckily still possible, um, the geography and history of Palestine. You see, what we witness today, not only 70 years of a Nakba, we witness a history, continuous history of European colonial policy applied on us against every possible norm of international law, even today. We are not talking about Roman history. We're not talking about um, something lost uh, we are talking about the live memory of many people like me who witnessed a Nakba. So um, our past is our present. And therefore to study it is not a luxury. 
It is like reading your newspaper, except that you are a victim in newspapers. You are not reading it about any other people. And that's why silencing our history uh, is so important for the Zionist ideology. Unfortunately, some Arab governments succumb to it. Now, the education in Arab schools have diminished the value and the length of Palestine history in schools, which is a big crime. What we have to do and what we can do is teach our children the history and geography of Palestine, which is, as, as I said again, it's not a history, it's actually present day. So do that because the information now is abundant in the internet, in school, and you can say, circumvent all the obstacles if you let your children uh, know, know their history. Without a history, you have no identity, and therefore they should know their identity. It is quite possible now. There is abundant supply of information if you just search a little bit, and it is very powerful. Even take Ilan Pape, uh, who started the groundbreaking book, uh, Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which we knew. We knew everything about it. It's published. Now it's published in several languages. It is now possible to get the information unlike before. So it is on us, it's upon us to teach our children. Um, Dr. Salman, uh, there's a question uh, from Dalal. Uh, are your works used in universities? Uh, are Palestine studies of this type taken up by young researchers in universities? You mean young researchers in other universities, are they taking up Palestine studies? Are they using uh, your, your books and documentation in their, uh, in their research? Uh, yes, we, we receive a lot of questions from students who wanted to know more information. Um, for example, in something which most of you know about academia.edu, which records who sees what, we have uh, probably recently I looked, we have 289 mentions of our work in the literature. Um, but still, it is confined to students who want to know the truth. Um, any, uh, those even Israeli universities or something, they avoid quoting our references because they are scientifically based and very difficult to refute them. But others who are interested um, actually can find and mention them and use them. Still, there is a lot to be done. A lot to be done. It's all available. Uh, Dr. Salman, we have uh, uh, someone who would like to ask a question directly. So, uh, May Saikali, I'm, I'm asking you to unmute yourself and, and turn your camera on so you can ask the question. Uh, Hello, my very good friend of mine, a very distinguished author and researcher. Her latest work is about Haifa and the oral history. How are you, May? Hi, hi. I'm trying to put in the camera, but it's not working. That's okay. okay. You don't need to see me. You can hear me. Thank you, Salman. It's lovely, lovely to hear you today. It's so important to get this subject publicized and very significant is that uh, I put a note about certain books that were written, the things that we have to look at, as you said, both the Ottoman government was in turmoil and uh, the situation as well as the uneducation, but awareness and consciousness was very clear among the people. One such book would be the book of Maria Elia Rogers, who wrote it in 1845 about public life, social life in Palestine. These are certain side items we should look at to prove our points that people were aware, were conscious of 
the threat of the West and the threat of the Ottoman control. This book is essential to any, in my book, I bring it out indirectly to show the consciousness of the community of Haifa. Uh, my book is on Haifa and the northern of Palestine. People were aware, but furthermore, I've worked since then on oral history, particularly a very intense oral history of the Palestinian diaspora in the camps and inside on the destroyed villages and the stories you tell. I myself was born in Palestine before 48, and therefore my experience is like yours, a refugee all my life. I understand this and oral history is essential and should be taught to all our kids the narrative in order to really confirm all these maps to bring it out to life in our education. Thank you very, very much, Salman. Th thank you very much, May. I agree with you. Uh, Roger's uh, fine lady, she was uh, the sister of the British Consul and she wrote a very, very good book uh, about life in Palestine. But there are others who are just the opposite. The British yeah, Consul, yeah. Uh, 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 Finns, Finns, he right. was so, so much racist and he, he was welcomed by Palestinians and visited them and so on. And then he writes that when, is it, when will the day come when um, this country will be uh, rid of these people and it, restore, it, it will be restored to its original owners and so on. The, uh, his wife, Elizabeth Finn, writes uh, that the Fallahin of Palestine have no humanity. They don't have a sense of humanity. So uh, Rogers' lady, uh, uh, she wrote that book, uh, uh, is an excellent one, but it is an exception. Uh, right. All those are imbued with this kind of hostility to the natives. And this is part of, um, part, let, me, let me just add one thing. The Bilu, those Russian Jews who wanted to escape the pogroms in, uh, in Russia, they wanted to plant themselves in Palestine. And so to do that, they wanted to buy a piece of Palestine from the Sultan and to bribe the Ottoman officers. And it never occurred to them to, to see how the Arab people of the land they want to go to um, react. They actually ignore them completely as if they don't exist. So that this is an element of, um, of, of colonial settlers um, that the people don't don't count. We want the land without its people. That's their ideology. Correct. Correct. Yes. Uh, we, we have time for one more person. If anybody else would like to speak, uh, please uh, send um, a chat quickly. Uh, uh, we have one more question, uh, Faisal. Also a good one. Uh, so I, now I lost, I don't know who asked it, but basically they're asking if the Ottomans had any maps at the time of Palestine. Yes, this is a good question. The Ottomans created a number of maps um, and they were purpose oriented maps. For example, the railway they, uh, they built from uh, Damascus through Palestine to Medina. They had maps for that. Uh, they had maps uh, to serve certain projects they had. Uh, in other words, they, they had purpose-made maps on some localities for some purpose. Uh, I have not seen, maybe I didn't see, but I have not seen a general map uh, of all of Palestine except, except the general maps which are very well known, the names of localities and roads leading to them. In other words, they are very large scale. Of course, they have maps to show where Jerusalem is and uh, Nablus and Haifa and Akka, but these are like traveler maps. The detailed maps they have made only for projects they were interested in. That's what I know. Right. Thank you. Sam, yeah, would you like to say something? 
yes. Basically, this has been brilliant and moving, and I'm eternally grateful for so many. You're, you know, you're our crown jewel, and I, I know of no one who's done research like that. That is so great. I wish we could see mine. Uh, that would be totally lovely if you could turn on the <laughs> the video. So, just great thanks and great admiration. I cannot say any more. Just keep repeating. Uh, and I would have a million questions, but we have run out of time. Maybe we should bring you back again. Yes, yes, <laughs> I think. Uh, if you are willing to come again, we'd love it. Yeah, I, I think thank, we. Thank we, you, we, my we... dear Samia. Thank you, my dear Samia. Always to see you and to hear you is always a pleasure for me. Yeah, apologies to the rest of participants. We have a few more questions, but I think we, are, we ran out of time. Yeah, I think uh, we, we'd like to bring uh, Dr. Salman uh, one more time uh, in the near future. Uh, we look at this as, uh, as a first step and uh, there is such a thirst uh, for the knowledge that Dr. Salman brings. And a lot of people would like to know more. Uh, and uh, this was just an introduction, hopefully. And we look forward to other opportunities to uh, meet him again and, uh, and benefit from uh, his reservoir of Palestinian history. Uh, we are very grateful for Dr. Salman Abusitta for being with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we also grateful to all the work you do for Palestine over the years. Um, we'd like to thank uh, our followers on uh, Zoom and those who've joined us on Facebook. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, a recording of this will be available on Facebook and uh, uh, a better recording, an edited recording will also be available on the Palestine Museum website on, uh, on YouTube as well uh, within a day or so. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. So Thank much. you, Faisal. Thank you very much, Faisal. Thank you. For inviting me, for giving this opportunity to talk and uh, uh, communicate with your uh, friends and people who love and uh, appreciate the Palestinian Museum uh, mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nancy and Mervat from the Palestine Museum team. And uh, we hope to uh, see the rest of you uh, at one of our future events. Uh, and, uh, like we say, ma'asalama.